So it's a great pleasure to speak at the GeoTop Applied Seminar. Uh, applied applications of geometry and topology and algebra are very close to my heart. I have been editor for a journal in Siam, Applied Algebra and Geometry, because I believe strongly that these areas can bring a lot of uh, new ideas to applied problems. So today I want to talk to you about an application to computer science and, and optimization. So uh, where geometry appears very naturally. So the, 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 what I'm going to present is joint work with, uh, essentially there's three papers. I'm gonna present pieces of these papers today. So the first paper was with Moise Blanchard at MIT, um, Kentan Lubohus at Liege, Christos Atanasiadis, and Zhen Zhang, Zhang. Uh, they, with, we wrote a second paper. And then the most recent paper is with uh, Sean Kafer and Laura Sanita in Eindhoven. So what is this talk about? So this is the Applied Geometry and Topology Seminar. So I'm gonna talk about applications of geometry and topology to a very, very famous algorithm. So I'm not gonna assume you know this because I know many of you are more geometers. Um, so I will tell you what the applied, I will start telling you what the applied problem is. So this is kind of the outline of my talk. I will introduce you very quickly to the problem of linear optimization and what the simplex method is. It's a famous algorithm. Then you will see that there's a very natural topological structure, and we will use that topological structure to analyze the algorithm. And then uh, I will, you know, after talking about the algorithm, I will end with some open problems because I hope there, there's some young people in the audience that would like to solve these uh, open problems. Or even not so young people too, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so what is the problem? So what is the applied problem? So we are working with what is called the linear optimization method or the linear opt optimization problem is perhaps the simplest optimization problem that says the following. So you are given, uh, you want to um, maximize or minimize an ob a, a linear objective function. So there's almost as the simplest possible functions ever. But the, the catch is that you want to minimize this function or optimize this function satisfying some linear equations or inequality constraints. So here I wrote, as you can see here, I wrote um, subject to uh, inequalities A11, A, A, you know, A, A11X1, etc. So these are the linear inequalities. And uh, as people do in computer science, we don't believe in, 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 re, in irrational numbers. We only use real numbers for the, you know, the data, right, the input data. Uh, so all the information here is codified by a rational matrix, essentially. So now the geometry enters this problem right away because the set of all possible solutions, the set of, of, of what we call feasible solutions, the set of all possible solutions has to satisfy inequalities and equations. So therefore, the solutions is a convex set, is a convex polyhedron, in fact, right? Like this icosahedron here. And uh, so I'm trying to find the point, I'm trying to find a point in this, in this polyhedron that is maximizes a linear function, right? So, so that's the problem. Now, if you're a very pure mathematician, maybe you say, well, why is this interesting? Well, I hope you all believe that linear algebra is interesting. And if you believe that linear algebra is interesting, you should believe that linear optimization is interesting because in fact, the problem of linear optimization is completely equivalent to the problem of doing linear algebra over non-negative variables, right? So you want to solve a, a, a linear system of equations, AX equals B, but the, the variables have to be non-negative. So this is something that is, I think sometimes people don't know that, that uh, in some sense, linear optimization is the, the next level of linear, of the linear algebra, right? Okay. So that's the problem, that's the mathematical application that I have in mind. And now, uh, just in case you have never seen a linear programming problem in your life, I, I want to propose you one so that you keep it in mind. Uh, here is a transportation problem. These are my favorite linear optimization problems. So imagine you have some factories. Uh, so I'm gonna use my, 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 my colors here. So I have some factories you know, maybe I have a factory in Guanajuato and I have a factory in Mexico City, etc. And they, this is the amount of, of uh, laptops they produce, right? They produce some laptops. And, and then at the same time, I have demands on other on cities 
uh, of these laptops. So, for example, maybe Guadalajara needs to buy 220 laptops and Querétaro needs to buy 93 laptops, etc. No, so at, so the, there's a price. There's a there's a price. The CIJ is the cost. You know, is the cost for sending a laptop from from the factory I to the CTJ. So so that's the the price. So the, the the transportation problem is a very simple question. What is the best assignment you can make of sending the laptops to the cities uh, by minimizing the cost, right? This is minimizing the cost. And this is literally one of the first linear optimization problems in history. <clears throat> and Kantorovich and Kupmans got the Nobel Prize in economics for this. Uh, for Neumann wrote a lot of papers about this problem as well. But so that's something that can be an example of a linear optimization problem. And it, it has a lot of applications. In fact, uh, if you have study optimization, you know that linear optimization is extremely important for many reasons. It's super simple, but it can be used to, to solve more difficult problems. For example, if you want to do combinatorial optimization problems like the traveling salesman problem, you often reduce the solution to a system of, or a sequence of linear optimization problems. Or if you want to do nonlinear optimization problems, like in machine learning now, these days is very fashionable, you would like to approximate that with a linear problem. Anyway, it has many, many applications. In graph theory, for example, the max flow mean code problems on flows on graphs and uh, you know connectivity on graphs is related to linear optimization. In the statistics, linear regression. More recently, if you are familiar with geometry, the Kepler conjecture was solved using computers, but it's essentially solving linear optimization problems. So linear optimization is extremely important in many areas of mathematics. And there are many, of course, there are many algorithms to solve the, simple, the, the, the optimization problem. Today, I want to talk to, to you about the, what I consider the most beautiful algorithm in history is the simplex method. So the simplex method is very important. It was in, in, in the year 2000, it was selected as a top, one of the top 10 most influential algorithms in, in the century. And the reason this is uh, so influential is because it's used everywhere. I mean, it's really used everywhere. And um, so what is the simplex method? So first of all, here's a photograph of George Danzig. Uh, this, the, he invented the simplex method in 1947. And you will see, I'm going to give you a, a short introduction to the simplex method. For geometers, it's, very, the beautiful, it's a very beautiful idea. I will skip a lot of details, of course, but uh, I'm going, it's a very beautiful idea. Um, OK, so let's see. Yeah, here it is. So first of all, when you have, remember that the, the, the set of possible solutions is a polyhedron, right? Now. This polyhedron has a one-dimensional graph, so that every polyhedron uh, has several faces of faces of different dimensions. You can decompose a polyhedron as a union of uh, different skeleta, right? And and you can consider the graph, the one-dimensional skeleton of this polyhedron, and you can consider that. And and the linear function that you are maximizing gives you an orientation of the graph. So, for example, here. So if I have an objective function that uh, that goes, oh, sorry, here, an objective function that goes in this direction, so this is the minimum value, right? I start at the minimum value, and I end up at the maximum value, right? So here, here is here is the orientation. I get an orientation uh, of the of the graph of the polytope, and this orientation is very very particular because it has to be a cyclic. There cannot be cycles on the graph. And every face has a unique sink and a unique source. So it cannot be that you have, uh, yeah, you, you, not, you don't have a cycle like this. So for example, maybe if it is a hexagonal, a, a, a hexagonal face, you cannot have uh, two sinks like that. That cannot happen, right? This is not possible. So, so this is a very interesting question, right? So. Um, you you want to consider these orientations. So here's another example with the dodecahedron, and you can see this is the minimum, this is the source, and this is the sink. So this is the essentially the the the, the simplex method as I'm going to show you in a moment. Essentially, is working on this directed graph. 
but it has to respect the orientation. It cannot violate the orientation. So I'm interested in these monotone paths for that reason. Okay? Are you with me so far? Are there any questions? Good. Um, okay, so let's see. So here is a here is a simplex method. Normally, when I teach this to undergraduates, I take you know three four weeks to explain the method and go over every detail. There's a lot of linear algebra involved, of course, on everything I'm telling you, uh, numerical analysis, etc. But uh, I'm gonna give it give it to you for in two, in two three minutes. Okay, here is the idea. So first of all. If there is an optimal solution, it has to be at one of the vertices of the polytope. That's the first observation. So uh, you can start then at a vertex. So like I'm, I'm showing in this picture here, you can start at the, at the vertex. And if that is not an optimal solution already, there has to be a neighbor, there has to be an edge that improves the objective function value. So you, get, you can fi find a red edge that improves. And that is a, an edge in the direction of improvement. That means that it's directed in the right direction, right? So I, I can improve, so I improve the edge, and I'm now in a second vertex, right? So I moved along that edge and I, and, and I improve. Now, that's maybe not, a, not an optimal solution, so therefore I can still improve. I can improve again. And sometimes, remember, there might be choices. There might be choices of the edges. So for example, here, it's possible that uh, it's possible that maybe I have a choice of taking this edge or taking the the, the other red edge. Um, I have to use something called a pivot rule. So a pivot rule is a way to uh, to select to select an edge. Essentially, it's a, it's a it's a it's an algorithm to select an edge. And there are many different pivot rules. But uh, essentially, the, that's why the, we don't talk about the simplex algorithm. That, that's one of the reasons that people talk about the simplex method, because there's not a single algorithm. There's a family of algorithms. It depends on the pivot rule you choose, essentially. OK? So anyway, so you keep improving. You keep improving. You know, you move along the directed graph until, until you cannot improve anymore. So once you have, uh, you know, yeah, once you have uh, no no improve, improvement, that means you have reached an optimum and you are done. So that's the simplex method for you. So are there any questions about the simplex method? It's very simple. I mean, I skipped a lot of details. For example, I didn't tell you how to keep track of the vertices, right? There's a, there's a way to keep track of the vertices. There's a way to select a, a new edge, a new, a new direction of improvement, etc. no? So it's a very important algorithm and it's super fast. I mean, we can solve optimization problems with millions of variables using the simplex method now. Are you with me? Any questions or complaints, comments? You are assuming that uh, the polyhedron is bounded. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to assume, yeah, thank you, Gilberto. Sometimes the polyhedron is not bounded and even then we can work with that. But I'm gonna assume in this talk that everything is bounded because I can always detect unboundedness. Um, yeah, I, I will. I will assume that my setup is. I, I'm given a convex polytope. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so here is what I consider the model of. Yes. Excuse me. I have a, uh, also a question. Are you assuming that, that uh, for any two adjacent vertices in the graph? Uh, so I don't. I didn't no, hear the question again. Am I assuming you, what? That uh, for any two adjacent uh, vertices in the graph one in one of them the uh, optimization function is better than the other do you are you yeah are ties? yeah thank you yeah that's i'm also assuming that the that the objective function is generic yes because so what i think the question is whether can it happen that i have for example an objective function that is um, it gets the same value in two adjacent vertices or, uh, you know, that there's a tie, in other words. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I'm assuming that that's not the case, but that's not a big assumption because I can always perturb if, if there's a, essentially, there's, if there's an objective function that is not generic, that is not, uh, I can always add a little perturbation and it will become generic. So then, in other words, 
the the there's no there's no ties on the graph. Every every edge is directed. Every edge is directed. Everything is fine. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. That those thank are two assumptions. Yeah. Any other question? Maybe or no? Okay. So now, one of the most famous open problems in computer science and in optimization is: Is there a version of the simplex method that runs in polynomial time in the input size? So, for example, is there a is there a pivot rule? Is there a rule for choosing the edge that I'm improving for choosing the path? You see, I'm choosing a path, right? Uh, for choosing the path, always in a way that is. I only take an, a, a polynomial number of steps. And what do I mean by polynomial here? I just want to clarify that. So when I give you a polyhedron, so what's the input size? Let's talk about the input on the for a computer science person. So the input is, uh, so I, I'm given a set of inequalities, right? AX less than or equal to B. So it's the number of rows. So I have no M is the number of rows. N is the number of columns of the matrix, right? And then I have to also use the size of the, the 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 bit size. So essentially, I need to encode my numbers into bits, right? This, that's why I always use rational numbers. So I want to say L is the bit size. So that's the the largest uh, uh, encoding of a binary number in binary of the of the numbers that you use, the largest numbers you use. And so this this is the encoding length. Are there versions of the of the simplex method that run in polynomial in these three numbers? And and that's something we don't know. And in fact, people would like to know whether there are poly, strongly polynomial time algorithms. So in other words, that they run polynomial in M and N alone. They don't need to use L. But we don't know that either, right? In general, there are some cases we know, but we don't know in that general. In fact, uh, let me say the following. So let me go to the next question. So one of the biggest issues and one of the reasons geometers need to be under, interested on this is, uh, is there a polynomial bound on the length of the monotone path? Remember, because I'm selecting a monotone path on, the, on this polytop. So I would like to find a bound, for example, maybe in terms of the number of facets and the dimension, right? Why? Because suppose that uh, Gilberto writes to me and says, hey, P Jesus, I have a polytop every shortest path is exponentially long, right? It takes a long, long time. Maybe it's n to the m or something. Well, then the simplex method is, is doomed. It's not going to be able to run in polynomial time because every path is exponential. So therefore, the number of steps you're going to take has to be exponential in the best play, in the best scenario, right? So, so that's why everybody wants to know what's the, what's the bound on the, on the length of a monotone path that you can have on the, poly, on the polyhedron. Okay, so that's kind of the, the big question I'm going to study today. Uh, I mean, there are other very fascinating related questions, like what is the best pivot rule that you can choose from? That's something that I'm very interested in today. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I have also done some work on that. Um, so I want to understand the monotone paths of the polytope. So I'm given an objective function, and I orient the graph. So I have a, a lot of monotone directed graphs that go uh, in this uh, polytope, on the graph of the polytope. And I want to understand them all. I want to see what can I say globally. I want to have a global topological study of these paths, okay? For example, I would like to answer um, questions such as, uh, what is the, num how many, how many monotone paths can there be? That's a question that I would like to answer. Uh, for example, what is the, the, the linear optimization problem that has the most monotone paths? That would be an interesting question. Another question that is fascinating is, of course, what, is the, what are the possible lengths? You know, what are the shortest paths? How long can they get? What are the longest paths? So, so both extremes of the, of the lengths on the paths, right? So you will see now that there's a lot of interesting uh, geometry related to this question. So my so essentially my point of view is let's try to be a little bit topological here. Let's try to look at the space of all top all all monotone paths together, because I think people in optimization have been just looking at one particular path, some special types of paths that they don't look at all of them together. That's a mistake in some sense. So I want to try to see a global uh, topological understanding of all these spaces. 
Are you with me? That's the plan. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Yep. No, okay. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to start with the space of all monotone paths. So first of all, I'm going to make a little reduction for a moment because then the, the, the theory becomes a little bit cleaner. It's not, a, it's not a very big assumption, but it will make things a little bit cleaner. So I'm going to start assuming for now on, so this is an important, uh, at least for now, for a little while in my talk, I'm going to assume that I'm, I'm going from the, from the minimum to the maximum, right? Because there are monotone paths that don't go from the minimum to the maximum. For example, maybe um, I can have, let's say this, yeah, this, I can start here and I can go like this. This is another monotone path, but that, that's a monotone path that starts in a different vertex. So I'm gonna try to count monotone paths, how many monotone paths are there from the beginning to the end? And this is not a big loss of generality because I can always complete a path as you can see, I can always complete a path to be starting at the beginning and and ending at, at the at the end, essentially. So remember it goes the beginning is the minimum, so that's what I call a minimum value, and then the the end is the is the maximum value of the of the objective function. Okay? So now I'm gonna define something that uh yeah, so that's that's my assumption here. I'm going to define, now I'm going to make a very important definition, so please uh, pay attention. This definition is something that I think Lalo, Lalo uh, Rivera is going to like a lot. So this is a definition of a flip on, on this graph of monotone paths. So what I do uh, is I have two monotone paths. For example, here's my monotone path number one. Um, so I'm going to put some colors here, maybe. This is number one. And this is number two. And I notice that these two monotone paths are essentially the same, except that they are different in this in this polygon, right? So they are different in this yellow polygon. You see, the, the, they are different in this yellow polygon. So so what I can do, I define as a flip is the in a in the yellow polygon, you see that the the top the path number one goes on top, right? And in the in the other path, it goes on the bottom, right? It goes like this. So you have a choice. You have two choices to select which one to go. So what I do is for every two-dimensional face, every two-dimensional face that is prop, you know, if I have an orientation on that on that two-dimensional face, the I, I I'm going to define a. Uh, uh, an adjacency is a graph. The vertices of this graph are going to be the different monotone paths. And two of these monotone paths are connected by an edge. If there is a, if there is a common two-dimensional face, right? Like here, there's a, this uh, green, uh, sorry, yellow uh, two-dimensional face, that they, you, one of the paths uses the top and the other one uses the bottom. So if I have my polygon, either I go on top or I go on the bottom, right? So that's, that, those are the two, two choices. And that's what I do. This is the, my flip graph. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to send you, show you a beautiful example here with the dodecahedron. This is the flip. This is a flip graph. This is a flip graph of the dodecahedron. And uh, you can see it's, well, it's, a, it's an interesting graph. And I will show you in a moment. It has a, a lot of very interesting properties. Um, so, for example, here you can see that the, all the monotone paths are pres present and they are connected, actually. So, these are, uh, the, the dodecahedron has, all, these are exactly all possible monotone paths from beginning to end of the, of the dodecahedron. And, uh, yeah, you can see the connection. Not, for example, there are some that are not connected to each other, like these two are not connected to each other. Um, Okay, so now what are, what are the properties of this graph? I'm interested to understand this graph. So I would like to know how many vertices are there, you know, how many? So this, let, me, let me put some questions here. So how many? You know, how many vertices? That's a big question, right? So then I also want to understand how connected is the graph, you know, how connected? And also, I want to understand the diameter. For example, how long does it take me 
So this graph has a diameter. No, the, the shortest path, the, the length of the short, the, the largest shortest path I need to go from one place to another. So, so there's a lot, a bunch of graph theory questions you can ask about this graph, and um, I want to say a few things about these questions today. Are you with me? This is the plan. Yeah. So, so now we are gonna start with the, so a little bit of topology. Well, here, here is the first surprise. In 1994. Uh, Villera, Kapranov, and Sturmfels study not not the graph directly, but they study a CW complex. So that's a polyhedral complex, essentially, built with polytopes. It's on, on, on a high-dimensional object that the vertices of the, the, the graph of this CW complex is actually the graph that I just showed you. And um, yeah, so the, 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 this, this uh, object is sometimes called the uh, the, the complex of um, um, coherent strings, cellular strings, sorry. So they call the, this the complex the, the cellular string complex. Okay? And what they prove is something that is going to be important for us in a moment, is that in fact, it's always homotopy equivalent to a two-dimensional uh, d minus two-dimensional sphere. So if you are started with a d-dimensional d polytope, then this has to be homotopy equivalent to a d minus two-dimensional sphere. So in the example that I show you, the, let's go back to the example so you understand the theorem. So the, here the, the, the dodecahedron is three-dimensional, right? So three-dimensional. And um, so the, this is supposed to be homotopy equivalent to a, to a one-dimensional sphere. Uh, so, so here, here is the sphere. You can see it. And what happens is that these these are these cells are filled. So that this is actually a CW complex, and and I can contract. You know, I can do a contraction here, on this on this. Uh, these are these are two dimensional cells that I can just shrink, and then it 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 contracts to this to this uh, one dimensional sphere. Okay. So that's that's uh, that's actually a polytope. That's a famous polytope. I will talk about that in a moment. Um, so in other words, the graph always looks like this. So let me describe to you the graph in a cartoon. So what they what these guys are saying is that there's a polytope, and then there's some some extra topological junk. Let me draw the junk in 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 red. So there's some extra topological junk here but this extra topological junk is contractible right so that's uh, so that immediately implies that the graph has to be connected the graph surprisingly the graph is connected so then uh, about six six years later uh, uh, Atanasiadi Edelman and Reiner proved that the graph is not just connected but it's actually in general is uh, if the polytope is nice if the polytope is simple um, uh, okay, what's a simple polytope? So a simple polytope is one where every every vertex has exactly dimension many facets coming into that vertex. So for example, the three-dimensional cube is a simple polytope. And they, they are very important. They are the duals of simplicial polytopes. So essentially, this is kind of the dual notion of, of simplicial polytope. Um, so, but in fact, in general, the graph can be just too connected. So it's connected, but barely connected sometimes. For some some nasty polytopes can be can be very degenerate. So, um, but in general, the graph is at least connected, right? So that's that's good. We are trying to understand this this graph. For example, I would like to to apply this graph uh, to understand the lengths of the of the paths, or also to try to understand what is the what is the the. If I do a random walk on this uh, flip graph, I would like to understand how does it look for a random monotone path. Okay, so the first question I want to discuss is exactly the flip, the, the, the diameter of the flips. So I want to tell you a theorem that discusses, um, discusses the, the, the diameter of this graph, the diameter of this graph. So we, we don't know a, a full answer. We don't know a full answer. Um, but we can we have a complete answer for three-dimensional polytopes. So when the, the dimension when the polytope is three-dimensional, like the case of the dodecahedron, the cube, etc., 
we have a we have a nice answer and the the answer is that if your polytope has n vertices then you have essentially a quadratic bound on the diameter so in other words you're never going to take more than quadratic many steps to go from one fle from one monotone path to another monotone path and we also have an, a lower bound that is uh, pretty close to the to the upper bound so at least uh, asymptotically we know it has to be quadratic it's, so we don't have an exact answer for this um but uh, we don't have any idea what's what's so the same question for dimension four dimension five etc is wide open it's wide open so let me tell you a little bit about the proof of the, the idea of the element the ingredients of the proof because i think i mentioned this already that there's a polytope behind the flip graphs so uh so i i need to define for you some some polytope so let me define this polytope for you so I was just want to remind you what I was saying before on this. Uh, when, when you have this, the 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 the, the simplicial, the, this cellular complex is homotopy equivalent to a sphere, but it's not just a sphere; it's a polytope. It's a convex polytope, and I'm, I want to introduce that polytope now. Okay, here is the way, the best way to introduce the polytope. So when you have an objective function, for example, you go in this direction. This is the objection, the direction C of optimization. This is the way uh, the objective function you are minimizing or maximizing. So you are defining a linear map. You are defining a linear map from the polytop. So this is my polytop P. I define a linear map, a projection down to a line, right? I, I project the vertices, for example, this vertex here, B1, projects to this, to this point. And this last vertex B8 projects to this to this point along a line, right? That's, you're doing a, a linear projection. Now, if I look at the linear projection, I have uh, I have fibers of this projection. For example, if I look at the inverse image, what is a fiber here? So the, the fiber, I mean the inverse image of a point. So for example, if I have if I pick the point here, the point here uh, V5. The inverse image is this hexagonal figure, right? It's like the it's a slice, it's a slice of the polytope that I was using before. Are you with me? So yeah, I have. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> if I have the slices, how many different slices am I going to get? Well, I have infinitely many different slices, but the point is that these slices are not different. These are actually very, very similar. There's finitely many different slices, actually. There's finitely many different slices. Um, they are all the same type of polytope. For example, if if you guys slice close to this point, the fiber of that will again we will, will be a hexagon. Near near that, in an epsilon neighborhood, it will also be an, uh, a a hexagon. Or here, imagine uh, here is very easy to see. So this is a triangle. This is the inverse image of this point, right? But if you slice a little to the to the right, you get a bigger triangle. But you see, it's the same type of triangle. It's a it's a similar triangle. The, the sides are parallel. You see that? Mm -hmm. So you actually have finitely many finitely many uh, slices. There's finitely many slices. Fi there's finitely many finitely many uh, fibers. Finitely many uh, different fibers. And if you take the Minkowski sum of these fibers, you get a polytope. And that polytope is actually, is actually the, the, the deformation. So this is the, when you do the homotopy reduction, that, that is the, the polytope that I was looking for. And the vertices of this polytope are in bijection with some of the monotone paths. Not, not all of the monotone paths, but something that I call the coherent monotone paths. Now, who are these paths? It's very difficult to explain. A for, but let, let me just say for the experts, I know I know um, people that like Gilberto knows about simplex method. In the simplex method, these are exactly the monotone paths that you take by the shadow vertex pivot rule. So essentially, uh, this this theorem is a topological theorem, but it says that uh, if you translate this theorem in optimization terms, this is saying that the the homotopy deformation tells you exactly the most important pivot rule. And this is exactly the most important pivot rule because it has very good results, theoretical results. So that's that's why it's so exciting about this, this theorem. 
And uh, what this is saying is that all of the, uh, all I have to do, the lemma is that all I have to do is measure the distance from a monotone path to these special coherent monotone paths, right? So again, coherent monotone paths, they come from a special pivot rule on the simplex method. Uh, it's a special rule to select the pivots, right? Uh, to select the, the, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the element, the, the ingredient. Yeah, so we need to use the fibers. We compute this polytop and then we figure out the distance from the from these coherent paths to the everybody else. And that's how we can get a bound. Now I can use these type of ideas to, to bound how many how many how many uh, monotone paths are there. And um, it turns out that the answer is beautiful too in, in dimension three. Again, this is the answer for three dimensional polytops within vertices. So this this is um this is the these are the bounds. The number of monotone paths that you can have on a three-dimensional polytop is no is at least this much, uh, n over two essentially. And the upper bound is a beautiful number. You guys have heard of the Fibonacci numbers, I'm sure. Well, the Tribonacci numbers. So you know the Fibonacci numbers are defined in terms of the previous. You add the, the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers, right? So here, the Tribonacci numbers is you get the next Tribonacci number by adding the sum of the previous three, right? It's, a, it's an obvious definition of what the Tribonacci numbers are, right? It's very surprising, right? It's very surprising that the Tribonacci numbers turn out to, to, to be the bound here. So, so in other words, there's no, there's no three-dimensional polytope that has more monotone paths than the Tribonacci numbers. And, and the example, I show you, I had a picture here. Let me show you. Ah, here is a picture. Here's a polytope. Uh, you obtain this polytope by stacking uh, tetrahedra. So you can see this is, this. Is, I, I, I have one tetrahedron here. And then I put another, a new tetrahedron on top of it, right? You can see, a, then there's a next tetrahedron and so on. So this is called a stack polytope. This is called a stack polytope. <clears throat> and the stack polytope is the optimal solution. So this is the the guy that actually has uh, the Tribonacci numbers as the number of uh, of monotone paths. And now, in general, uh, we have a, a bound for the for the d-dimensional polytope. So when d is bigger than three, this is the bound you get. So it's kind of very similar to the bound that we had before. And we also have a nice bound here, um, two to the n minus two. In this case, is achieved by the dual of the simplex uh, of the cyclic polytope. So this is achieved by a famous ob object in geometry. This is the dual of the cyclic polytope. So uh, as you as you probably know, the cyclic polytope is very important in in combinatorial topology because essentially triangulated spheres cannot have more faces than this guy, right? So this is, turns out to be a, in higher dimensions. It's also the polytope that does not have more, uh, doesn't have more uh, monotone paths either. So that's uh, also kind of surprising. Are there any questions so far about these results? Uh, uh, the, the upper bounds are tight. Uh, the upper bounds in dimension three are tight. Yes. So I show you the example for the Tribonacci numbers. So for the for this uh, for these the pyramids are. Uh, um, are give you the lower bound. Now for the for the uh, dimension four and higher, this is tight, but the lower bound is not tight. We don't know the exact uh, lower bound. We feel there has to be a better polytope actually. There has to be other polytopes that have that have the smallest number of um, yeah the, the total number of facets uh, of of is uh, yeah we don't think this is tight. The lower the lower bound yeah. Okay, but but the upper bound is tight. The upper bound is tight. Yeah, this, the dual cyclic polytope is already the the best you can do. I mean, the graph the graph of the polytope in that case you are is a tournament, right? In this, in terms of graph theory, the graph of the the oriented graph you're dealing with is a tournament, and that's that's how you can get two to the n minus two um, different monotone paths there. All right, so. In, in my in my remaining time, I want to go to the most important question 
which is the length of the monotone path, because that's what we want to know. I want to be uh, solve this famous open problem, right? So how, what can we use, what can we say topologically, geometrically about the length of the monotone paths? So of course, uh, you can say, well, what if I start with a monotone path and I then I start increasing the length or decreasing the length? You know, I can use some kind of Markov chain, right? I can start doing some kind of the uh, uh, greedy algorithm. I can start using greedy algorithm to find the, 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 the shortest path or something. And um, you can do that, but you will get stuck. There are local minima, right? There are, there are monotone paths that are minimal and that shorter than the, the neighbors, but they are not the shortest global, the global minimizers. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky problem, but we can say some things. Um, so let me just remind you that I'm I'm working on, on a directed graph, right? I'm working on a directed graph. Um, so so I I have an objective function c, and that gives me a directed path on this uh, on this. Now, for, by the way, now I'm I'm, I'm interested on in going from some vertex from some vertex to the optimal vertex. I'm not assuming anymore. I'm not assuming anymore that I'm starting at the minimum and ending at the maximum. The reason is because sometimes uh, when you look at length, that can be a completely different length, actually. That, that doesn't help you. When you are counting paths, yes, it's fine, but when you are considering the length, you need to start at, at a particular vertex and then you want to end uh, at the optimum. Okay, I, I'm very proud to present, first of all, the following theorem because it's very, very, very fresh. We just put the, the paper on the, on the archive, essentially. Um, so, uh, there's a very natural question, actually. Can you find the shortest oriented path from a point to the optimum efficiently? And the answer is no. It's MP hard, actually. So, it's, in fact, uh, in, unless P is equal to MP, it's, it's hard to even find a path, a, short, a path that is twice as long, right? That is better than two. So, that 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 proof is is really really nice uh, i'm not going to say too much about it uh well maybe if i have time at the end i can say more about it but it's it's, it's a very nice result i think and it shows that computing the monotone the the, the lengths of monotone paths is not so, not so trivial right anyway so once you can you have the monotone paths you can define what i call the monotone diameter right the monotone diameter again is the maximum length of a shortest monotone path and i'm taking um, the the maximum over every possible vertex, right? If I start from a vertex to the optimum, I have a, a shortest path, and then I take the maximum over that. I'll show you an example in a moment. So then I can talk about, uh, but this depends on C, right? This depends, so this one depends so far, so this one depends on the objective function. The answer will depend on, on C. But then I can I, I can define say okay, take the maximum over all objective functions, right? Now I take essentially I take the, the the linear optimization problem that is the worst ever I will ever see in my life, you know, for this particular polytope. So that is the that is the monotone diameter of a polytope, okay? And we will so the goal is to bound. So we we want to bound this number, right? We want to bound this number. Now there is a similar number that is even worse. It's called this, the height, where instead of looking at the shortest, shortest monotone paths, I look at the 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 longest, right? I look at the longest monotone paths. And again, the longest monotone path is going to depend on the objective function that you choose. But then I can take the maximum over all possible uh, over all possible objective functions. So, and that's what I call the height. So, so that's an even worse number, right? That's like the really, really worst things that can happen in your life. This is when you go really long paths. So, let me give you an example so you understand. Here is a very nice example. So, this is a this is a, a cube. It's a three-dimensional cube, but it's not. So, it's not a regular cube, right? Re regular cube is very symmetric, very nice. I'm, I'm trying to draw a three-dimensional cube here that is like a regular cube. So, here, this is a this is what I call the Clementi cube. It's a deformed cube. You are not going to believe this. This is a this is a really strange object because the, the, you see there's a red monotone path 
you can actually find a, a monotone path that um, starts essentially here and goes through every vertex, right? So this, this monotone path has length uh, two to the n, right? So essentially it passes through every vertex. So in other words, for the Klimenty cube, there are monotone paths that are as long as you, as you can be, right? They, they are long, the length, they pass through every vertex and there's two to the n vertices, right? Now, on the other hand, look at this. I'm going to put it in green now. So this is a monotone path, right? Of course, if you want to look at the, if you go from B to U, the shortest monotone path is this green path, but there's a, a monotone path that is uh, length two to the N, right? So that shows you the difference here. And again, it really depends where you start. For example, if I start here, if I start here, the best I can do is three. You see, I, I cannot do better than three. Yeah, so I have to go in three steps. But if I started here, I can go in one step. So it really depends on where you start. So that, that's what makes this problem difficult, okay? I hope this example helps you understand. And also, uh, here's a, a message for the geometers or the topologies, you know, like Jose Carlos might say, well, coordinates don't matter, I'm a topologist. Well, here, the coordinates really matter, right? Because the coordinates of the cube, so if I do a zero, one cube, I cannot find these nasty monotone paths. The, the, in the zero one cube, monotone paths are very short. Yeah, but in this, the, this is a deformed cube. The Klimenty cube is is deformed, and I can get this topological behavior. I mean, this weird behavior. Okay, uh, let me just go to the next thing. Okay, so I want to present to you my one of my our theorems bounding the 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 the, the, the monotone diameter. And for that, I need to introduce a family of polytopes very quickly. Um, so a sonotope, what is a sonotope? A sonotope is, you give me edges, so I have some uh, M edges of my sonotope, so A1, A2, AM, and I take all possible Minkowski sums of these, ed of these segments, of these uh, edges. So here, uh, in, in, in algebraic terms, this means that I'm taking all positive, all negative, com all combinations of these, uh, of these edges with zero, zero, uh, with numbers lambda one, lambda two, lambda m between zero and one. And here is a little example when, when, uh, if I take this here, m is equal to four, right? I have four, four edges. And the sonotope is this, this nice region that you see here, right? This is the sonotope. It's, um, um, yeah, so this is an octagon of some kind. And it's, it's a beautiful object. And one of the reasons I'm interested in this object is because I can figure out the, the monotone diameter. And in fact, I can mono figure out the height of a sonotope. So the monotone diameter of a sonotope and the height is bounded above by the number of, of, of directions, the number of, uh, of edges that you have. You can never be, uh, be longer than that. So the, the, mo the monotone paths are very, very short, so to speak. They are never more than M, where M is the number of edges. Is it clear? Okay. Yep. So here is the reason I care about them. So I, I can take a polytope, just take, take any polytope, you have a polytope P, um, and then you, you want to, you take a polytope P, and I can consider the, the edges of this polytope. So let E be the, the set of all directions of this polytope, yeah? And then I can construct a sonotope. It's a sonotope that I, I obtain from the edges of my polytope P. Right, again, so E, these are the edges of P. Here's a little example here. So if this is my P, so here below you can see a picture. Uh, if this is my P, so I have, how many different edge directions I have? I have three edge directions because this, these two edges are parallel, right? So I only have three edge directions, you see them here. And with these three edge directions, I can construct a sonotope. This sonotope is this hexagon here. So I have more vertices, you see? So this, I, got, I go from P, I get a sonotope, a sonotope that depends on P. I can construct that sonotope very easily. 
Now, what, what is the big deal? Well, this, polyt this sonotope is, is really closely related to my original polytope. In what sense? So the, the first people that realized this, Gritzman and Sulfels, realized that the normal fans of the sonotope is a refinement of the normal fan of P. So what is the normal fan? When I have a polytope, the normal fan corresponds to the, to the normals at every vertex, right? For example, here, the vertices of this quadrilateral uh, that uh, ha are these four vertices, they have uh, the cone, these are the cones of uh, all the objective functions that maximize at that vertex. So, for example, a pentagon like this guy here has five, five, um, five uh, uh, cones, and they, they, they form a fan. So the union of these cones is a fan that covers Rn, and that's the normal fan. But you see, I can think of I can think of walking on the vertices of this polytope, or I can think of walking on the regions, the regions of the fan. So I, I can, so if I'm in, in P, I'm walking on the vertices, right? Walking on the graph. But here on the other side, in the other picture, I'm walking from a region to another region. So here I'm, I'm walking from, from cell to cell. You know, I'm walking from cell to cell. It's the same thing, it's equivalent, it's kind of a dual, it's a dual picture, right? It's, it's, not, it's not any different. Anyway, so using this idea, we can, we can nicely prove that if you have a polytope, the monotone diameter of that polytope is bounded above by the monotone diameter of the sonotope associated to that polytope. And as a corollary, then you can prove that the, the number of the, the monotone diameter is bounded above by the number of edge directions of the polytope. So you, you just count how many different edge directions are there on your polytope, and that's a bound on the monotone diameter. So that's kind of nice, right? That's kind of nice. Um, let me show you some applications. I think, uh, I think Gilberto will get excited to see some of these applications. So this is dedicated to Gilberto for sure. Uh, Thank so you. he likes this, this likes Metro. He likes Metroid. So actually, Matroid polytopes, all the matroid. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So matroid polytopes, how many edge directions are there? Well, in edge, in matroid polytopes, we know, I think uh, Gilberto used this in his thesis, that <laughs> EI minus EJ are all possible edge directions of matroid polytopes or polymatroids, right? So there's essentially for a matroid with n elements, there's n choose two possible edge directions, right? So you immediately get a polynomial, a quadratic bound on the, on the monotone diameter of, of a matroid polytope or a polymatroid. Now you remember, you remember the transportation polytope I gave you at the beginning of my lecture, right? Well, so what happens if you have the number of factories, for example, there's only a factory in Guanajuato, there's one factory in Celaya, and there's, uh, there's one factory in Salamanca. I think people know where I'm talking about, right? And so the number of factories K is fixed. So K is fixed. So then you have the cities, right? That you may have millions of cities. You may have millions of cities that you need to sell the laptops. So the factories, there's only three factories of laptops in Mexico. So that's K is fixed. So then I can prove that the diameter, the monotone diameter of this polytope is also going to be uh, polynomial. It's going to be of the order E times k factorial times e to the k, but because k is a constant, is is a polynomial of 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 degree k. Now the question is, can you find other polytopes, uh, other combinatorial polytopes that the number of edge directions is nice, right? So so I'm using the lemma, right? I'm using the the theorem that I showed you before, to show that some polytopes are are well behaved because the number of edges they have is well behaved, right? Okay. Now let's talk, uh, finally, in, in my last five, five minutes or so, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, some very popular polytopes that are the so-called combinatorial polytopes. So, so what's a combinatorial polytope? Uh, it's classical in, in optimization to study polytopes that the coordinates of the vertices of these polytopes are zeros and ones. Uh, so there are many important polytopes like this. So let me start with may, maybe the most famous one of them is the the traveling salesman polytope, right? The traveling salesman polytope. Uh, 
So what is this? So essentially, you you have uh, you have all the possible ways to tra travel, and you have five cities, and you have many different ways to travel. You maybe you go you can go in this direction. You want to visit every city once without repetition, right? But you can also do it this way, maybe. Oops, sorry, I don't want to use green. Sorry, I want to use. Uh, ah, I cannot change color apparently. Okay, it's okay. Ah, okay. Maybe I want to go like this, right? I want to go. So I can do different different uh, tours. I can do different traveling salesman tours, and. Um, for every traveling salesman tour, I, I set one or zero depending on which which arc I use, right? Which edge I use. So that's 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 an example of a zero one combinatorial polytop. Another example is matching polytops, where I have a graph and I have a zero or a one depending on the, you know, depending on whether I I have um, the matching on a graph or not, right? So I'm, I'm matching, uh, you know, jobs to people or whatever. So I can study these types of polytops and try to say something about the the diameter of these polytops. Okay. Now, first of all, I'm going to show you a, a nice theorem. So first of all, the, the first part of the theorem is that many of these polytops have very, very, very long height. I mean, in other words, there's exponentially long. There are objective functions c for which the the matching polytops the perfect matching polytops, fractional matching polytops, the traveling Sesman polytop, the perfect two matching polytop, all of these guys have exponentially long monotone paths. So for some objective functions, you will, you will find very, 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 very long path, monotone paths. So you might get really, if you are not careful when you run your algorithm, you might get really lost, right? Nevertheless, at the same time we showed, uh, so this is again a very fresh theorem, um, that says that uh, given a, a linear program that ha the feasible region is is a zero one polytope, so there's one of these combinatorial polytopes, then there is a, a the monotone diameter is bounded polynomially by strongly polynomially in the input size. So you, we we have a we have a proof that in fact using the steepest edge pivot rule, these guys uh, should follow a very very um, very short path. So, so that's a that's a very nice theorem because it tells you that this, this, there's a high contrast, right? You have these very important polytopes like the traveling Sesman polytope that they might they might have these wild topolo this this long pathological uh, long paths, but at the same time you can guarantee there's something short to get to the optimal solution, right? So I have one minute left, and I always want to end my, my, my presentations with open questions because I want people to work on, on, on the problems. I, I want to promote this research by inviting people to work on these problems. So again, we don't know yet any bounds for, for like good bounds for the maximum length of monotone paths. I mean, I show you examples that are exponentially long paths, but... Uh, yeah, I would like to, to have not just lower bounds, but also upper bounds on the monotone length. And a very interesting probabilistic question, if you like probability, anybody that likes probability, uh, what is the average length of a monotone path, right? That would be very interesting. Uh, and maybe the flip graph can be used to study that. Right? I mean, people study, uh, I mean, um, uh, I know Lalo Gonzalo Rivera has studied this uh, um, flips on, on, on trees, and you can do flips on trees, and at the same time in flips on trees, you get some randomness, right? You can do some, like an average tree. How does, how, how does the average tree look like? So you can study the same kind of question here. What's the average monotone path look like? If you do a, a, a random average monotone path, you do, you do a random walk on this flip graph, what does it look like? And also probability you want to understand the probability distribution of the length so what is the probability distribution of the lengths here then another question is um, you know i show you that we have now this proof that zero one polytopes are very have nice behavior on the monotone diameter but uh, are there other families maybe all of them are if you know if you want to be famous if you really want to be famous you can show that all of them are there's every polytope has a polynomial size size diameter, right? Or you want to be famous, but in a negative way, 
you can solve the, you can find that there's a family with exponentially sized monotone paths, right? That's the, this will be the holy grail, the holy grail. There's even money, I think there's a million dollars for this question, if you are interested on being rich and famous at the same time, this is a good opportunity. Well, I think I'm gonna stop here. I have more, more conjectures and open questions, but let me stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. I, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you. Well, I have Thank several you. questions, Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the idea, for example, for the combinatorial polytops, yes, you are thinking uh, as the size of the polytop, as you define at the beginning, uh, yeah. the number of 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 constraints and and variables right. okay yeah no, but here but, i can do even uh, better i can do strongly polynomial actually i can just look at the number of variables and the, the number of constraints okay. essentially yeah but for so, example in the in the matching polytop yeah uh, well in the in the application let's say that we have an application uh right. about matching then you are interested knowing the in the size of the polytop but in the size of the graph Right. Yeah, so okay. you're right, you're right. Yeah, so in some sense, um, yeah, so let me go back to the specific polytope. So here is actually, um, so this is a, re a linear relaxation. So you, you you know, this is a real re relaxation of the, of the, this is a fractional matching polytope right here, right? Okay. So, so the, for this polytope, I mean, I know this is a fractional polytope, right? This is not a zero one polytope. But for this guy, we also have uh, we we have a bound on the. Uh, so I, I understand your question. So your question is the representation we know for the matching polytope is exponential in the in the in in n, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that that's right. So do we we don't have. Um, yeah. So we, in some sense, if your representation is small, we guarantee yes. Essentially, yes. For if your representation of a zero one polytope is small, like for a cube, for example, a cube has a small representation right then you can guarantee that the that the diameter has to be short yes that's essentially what we're saying yeah okay so the traveling salesman polytope for example it might have a huge representation so in terms of that representation is polynomially bounded but we don't know a short representation yeah we hope that we can use this to uh, to get to you know to get a better result <laughs> But by the way, for the fractional matching polytope, we also get similar result that there's a polynomial bound in terms of the representation, and and that representation is polynomial in the in in the graph in the size of the graph. Let's say, yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, um, yeah, I see. My other I see somebody question. Asking. Is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Gilberto, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, ha have you uh, tried to do something on the, well, no, I don't know if you are uh, uh, acquainted with Clover graphs. I the, have. The graph, uh -huh. Clover graphs, the graphs that are uh, K1, Step. 3, 3. Yes. Yeah, so this is a stable set. These are perfect graphs, right? Especially the, the stable set polytope is uh, nice. Uh huh. Um, no, we haven't looked at the stable set uh, polytope actually. That's an interesting question. I suspect that some of these might. I mean, we we there we have also a nice compact representation to some extent, no? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I I am not sure because there is a polynomial time algorithm for, for Clover graphs that is based on the matching polytope. But uh, I think it's independent of the, really of the polytope of the Clover graphs. Then uh -huh. uh, I, I, I am uh, curious about uh, how it looks in this, in this perspective. Yeah, I don't know. That's an, I didn't know this connection. Yeah, I, I don't know the, the answer to that. But I think you're right. I mean, the, anything related to a stable set polytope is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. 
Well, I think that uh, are, are my questions. I saw somebody send me a question about this Creed Morse theory, but I didn't catch it. It just flew flew by my screen. Um. I could read it to you if you, the author can. Yes, I, 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 yeah, or I okay. can stop the broadcast and I can. I can read it to you. Okay, it's I... uh, Doctor uh, Eli Al Alahar asks, "How is uh -huh. this related to discrete Morse theory? Is there a straightforward connection?" Um, not that I, not that I know actually. I mean. You're right that in some sense it has the same feeling as Morse theory because you have this, you know, you look at the, you're looking, you're going from some um, singular point, which is the minimum value to the up to the another singular point, but you are doing this in 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 convex sets, right? So the slices, uh, essentially, there's no, <laughs> the Morse theory is is kind of trivial in the sense that you you start at the, the singular point as the vertex. And then until you hit another singular point, and that's it. So the the, the Morse function is a little bit uh, trivial, but there might be I don't know. There might be ways to to make to make sense of a Morse theory on the on here. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Well, I have another another question, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, there is a, a generalization of, of linear programming, uh, the simplex method, to mm -hmm. oriented matroids. Oh, yes. Then uh, uh, I suppose that uh, you can do the same kind of thing there as you do in, in the... Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, or, oriented matroid program, uh, optimization in oriented matroids has been used to generalize um, Linear programming, right? Um, I don't know how to generalize the topological theory that is available there, Be because it, you see, the, this topological theory depends on the embedding of the polytope, to so, so to speak. Uh -huh. So you, you remember, I was looking these these fibers, right? I was looking at the slices, and that that I don't know how to do it with oriented matroids. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I can send you a new paper we have on oriented matroid uh, optimization, which has nothing to do with what I talked today, but it's, it's in the same topic, but it's not related to the methods that I spoke today. Okay. Yeah, there's some, some interesting connections to oriented matroids, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, not Jesus, thank you for a very nice talk.